Oh my Lord, breathe on me. Touch my eyes and me. Jesus, come fill this today. Lord, don't let us get out of here today without being changed. Don't let us get out of here today without having some kind of darkness broken off of our spirit, Lord God. Without going out of here lit up with your power and with your love. Without, don't let us go out of here today without, Lord, having something exposed that doesn't look like you and have it removed. Thank you, Lord. You know, I realized this year, Nathan said he'd been in ministry a long time. Well, that's my son. I changed his diapers when he was little. <laughs> I've been, I realized this year I've been in professional ministry 40 years. Two years part-time while I was in seminary. 38 years full-time. And I thought that makes basically 40 Easter's with 40 Easter messages. And when you're looking back on that kind of time, you know, you might think, after all these years, after 40 Easter messages, what's left to say? How do you come up with a new Easter message after 40 years? But you know what? (laughs) Every year, the revelation goes deeper. Every year, every year, the wonder of the Father's love in Jesus gets bigger. A lot of people running around thinking they're getting special revelation these days. Well, I'll tell you what, when you have plumbed the depths of the cross and understood everything there is to understand about it, then you come give me some special revelation. Every year it claims more of the core of me. And it needs to claim more of the core of us. This year I had the privilege of being part of a Good Friday gathering. It was called the Seven Last Words of Jesus. There were like 19 churches involved in this little bitty storefront building down in the inner city, down on Elmira Street. And although the group was interracial, it was about 90% African American. There were seven of us. They called us apostles and prophets that were gathered. We each spoke seven minutes. Two of us white, one of us, a 10-year-old boy preacher, several women. And we were from this like, crazy variety of styles. And so you'd have seven minutes of shouting and screaming where your ears would hurt, and then you'd have seven minutes of somebody reading the notes like this. Total variety of styles. Seven speakers, seven words, seven minutes. And it was all good. <laughs> it was all good. Because we're one Father, we're one blood in Jesus You want to try to imagine me preaching anything for seven minutes. (laughs) My assignment was the second of the seven words. Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. The scene is Jesus is hanging on the cross. Next to him are two criminals. So there's three of them up there. Jesus has been whipped within a stroke of his life. He's bleeding from multiple wounds. He's dehydrated from blood loss from having, and, and, and from having to carry his own cross through the streets. His blood pressure is dangerously low. Crucifixion was a suffocation position where you're, you're, because you were hanged like this, your rib cage would be expanded. And so you'd have to push yourself up on the nails in your feet in order to be able to exhale. And then when you couldn't stand the pain in your feet, then you'd let down, putting the weight on the nails in your, basically in your wrists, not in your hands, but in your wrists. And your lungs would fill up until you couldn't stand the pain, and, you know, and then you'd move again. And so what's happening is Jesus is laboring to breathe. His oxygen level is dangerously low. He's become tachycardic. His heart is racing because it's trying to pump enough blood and oxygen to his system to keep him alive. And the fluid has begun to gather around his heart. You know, it's good medical evidence that Jesus died of a burst heart, of a heart, basically a broken heart. And when they ran the sword up into his side and the blood and the water gushed out, that's because at that point of death, fluid gathers around the heart. So Jesus is very near death when this happens. 
In the Old Testament sacrificial system, the priest would lay his hands on the head of a sacrificial animal, transferring the sin of the people to the head of the animal. And when the animal died and its blood was shed, then sin was atoned for. The sin died with the animal and the sin was cleansed in its blood. Now the point is that sin and evil cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. Just can't. Because sin and evil cut us off from Him. Sacrifice cleanses the destruction, washes the defilement, it restores the relationship between God and man. So here's Jesus on the cross. He's our Lamb of God. He's our perfect sacrifice. He's once for all making atonement for all of our destruction and alienation in order to restore us to fellowship with the Father who loves us so desperately he'd give anything, he'd even give his own son to cleanse away everything that cuts us off from him. Our sin dies with him. His blood washes the defilement away. And so the door stands open. And all we need to do is receive the gift, step through the door, and let it transform us. God help you if all you said was a sinner's prayer one day and thought that did it. You've got to step through that door. Our destiny is now to become conformed to the image of the Son. That's what we're appointed for. To be conformed to the image of the Son, Jesus means that the love of the Father radiates out of us in every action, every word, every thought, every feeling, every dealing with another human being. And it all turns on intimacy with Father God, being restored. It all turns on being one with Jesus in his death, one with him in his resurrection. That's what the cross and the resurrection made possible. And so I began, when I got this assignment to preach seven minutes, (laughs) on that second of the seven last words of Jesus, I began to take a new look at it, why Jesus said that and what it meant. And who did he say it to? Luke, chapter 23, verse 39. If you've got your, your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhones, and all that kind of stuff. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And I read that because this leads up to that statement Jesus made. And I read that and I began to think, how much like you and me is that? See, what happens, and I watch this, I watch this in Christians, I watch this in the culture around us, we choose to live outside of God's laws that were designed in his love to produce the maximum good for us, and then when it doesn't work out and things begin to fall apart and the trouble starts, then we start playing the victim and blaming God for the destruction we brought on ourselves. Am I telling the truth? Stupid, unrighteous decisions we made all on our own because we thought we knew better than God. So we're crying out, oh God, save me. Why aren't you saving me if you're really God? That's the first criminal. Here's the second one, verse 40. But the other answer, this is a completely different attitude. The other answered in rebuking him. So he turns to the other one. You can just see him with all of his strength because he's being crucified too. He's shouting across Jesus to this other criminal on the other side, rebuking him. Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Interesting thing here. Jesus didn't say, today you'll be with me in heaven. He didn't use the word heaven. He used the word paradise. Paradise literally means a walled-in garden. In the ancient Near East, it was hot. They didn't have air conditioning like we do. So if you were a person of substance, what you would do is you would build a high wall around a water source. I mean, a really high wall around a water source. And you would, you would, you would plant green and growing things inside that enclosure so that it would be cool in that place. You could go, it was like having air conditioning. So you could go into this beautiful, green, lush place, shielded from the heat of the world, 
and, and you could be cool there and enjoy yourself. Well, kings built especially elaborate, rich gardens. And when an ancient Near Eastern king wanted to give somebody a really high and special honor, he would make him a companion of the garden, which meant that he was chosen to walk with the king in the garden. Intimacy, unguarded, rich, cool, refreshing, the highest of honors. Jesus has just been identified as a king. So he says, today, you get to be a companion of the garden. So I want to tell you, it was more than salvation Jesus gave to this criminal hanging next to him. It was a high honor. And more than being remembered in Jesus' kingdom, it was a promise of intimate fellowship with him in the most intimate of places. This is what we're invited to. See, the criminal who was getting, the, crim- the other criminal, you know, was, was getting what he deserved. He was reaping the penalty for his wrongs. And this criminal, he was getting what he deserved as well. Today, he says to this one, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, unlike, unlike the other criminal, this guy, other than, unlike the one that was mocking Jesus, this guy got a pair of revelations that set the course of, of, of his eternity. One was conviction of his own sin, and the other was a revelation of the identity and the nature of Jesus. I've learned something about what brings conviction. I've learned something about how people come to recognize the wrong in their lives and in their attitudes and in their ways. I've seen what really changes people. And I'll tell you what, it's not somebody preaching against sin. It's not somebody pointing out how wrong you are. Because that's not love, that's religion, that's condemnation. That's not what we're called to do. It's what we have a reputation for, but it's not what we're called to. What brings conviction, what changes people, is you and me bringing a living revelation, not of how wrong people are, but of how right Jesus is. And the key statement this man made was, this man has done nothing wrong. I want you to camp on that and hold on to that. This man has done nothing wrong. Hold that thought. He's hanging there next to Jesus, and even at the edge of death, Jesus is radiating the Father's heart with such power and such goodness and such purity and such love. You can never really describe it. You can only open your heart to receive it. And this man, is, this man next to Jesus is suffering agony like you and I can't even begin to imagine. Crucifixion was the most painful, lingering death man has ever invented. But what's flowing out of Jesus touches this guy and major changes begin to happen inside of him. It doesn't make any difference how much pain or trouble you're in. It makes no difference what you've done. It makes no difference where you've been unless you deliberately shut Jesus out, unless you deliberately hurl anger and bitterness at him like the man on the other side. You can always drink in his presence and be changed by it. It never gets that bad. And so this criminal says to the other criminal, we are suffering justly. We're getting what we deserve. One of the most powerful revelations you'll get when you really encounter Jesus, one of the most powerful revelations you'll get when you really encounter Jesus' love is the sense of how far short you fall. How wrong you've been about so many things how less than loving we really are, how less than selfless we really are. I can pat myself on the back. I can tell myself I'm a good person until I stand next to Jesus and then I know the truth because light exposes darkness. I was 17 years old. I thought my first car was a hot rod. All I knew is it's got a four on the floor. Let's go, you know, until a Lamborghini pulled up next to me. I can think I'm a good person. I can think I'm a good person until I get next to Jesus. And I get a real revelation of who Jesus is, and then I know how far short I fall. Our culture wants to convince us that we're good people. We're all good people. Because if we believe that we're good people, then we're all just victims of of bad things, aren't we? Bad things happen, I'm a victim because I'm a good person. Conflicts happen. 
I'm a victim because I'm a good person. Relational breakups happen, I'm a victim because I'm a good person. And all the rest of the stuff that happens in our lives, we think I'm a good person, I'm just, but I'm a victim of all this stuff instead of I'm a messed up, Im- imperfect, broken train wreck. That, and I'm reaping what I've sown. See, when people get next to what's right and what's good and what's holy and what's really loving, it exposes what isn't. That's what changed this criminal hanging next to Jesus when Jesus was making the ultimate sacrifice for our sake. See, the heart and the love of the Father flowed into him and around him and he saw himself for what he really was. And he changed. See, the light of the real Jesus, I'm not talking about the cultural Jesus. I'm not talking about the 77% of this country that thinks they're Christian. I'm talking about getting exposed to the real Jesus. You get exposed to the real Jesus, it's going to reveal evil for the destruction that it's brought because the good is so good. And the light reveals it to be good. What's imperfect can pass. You know, what's imperfect can pass is pretty good until the perfect shows up. Pharisees condemned sinners and called them to repent. And it produced nothing. Nothing. All it did was cause a division. Pharisees over here, hopeless sinners over here. But it was the raw presence of Jesus, just the raw presence of Jesus and the Father's heart flowing out of him that caused an immoral woman who might have been a prostitute to wash his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. He didn't have to say a word. He didn't have to say you've been wrong. All he had to do was be him. It was was the purity of the Father's heart and the Father's love flowing out of Jesus that caused that lion, cheating tax collector, you all know him, that was Zacchaeus, caused that lion, cheating tax collector to repent and give back four times what he'd cheated people out of. It wasn't the Pharisees condemning him. They'd been condemning him all along. What broke him and brought him to repentance was exposure to what was pure and right and good and holy and loving. See, what changed every sinner that Jesus met that nobody else would love was the sense of who he was radiating in all directions. It exposes my uncleanness and at the same time it floods me with mercy and love. Light reveals darkness. Real love exposes the counterfeit and the deficit. See, I can tell myself I'm a good person and I don't deserve a lot of the calamities that come my way, but when I'm exposed to the light of Jesus' presence, I know the truth. Probably going to mess with some of you here in a minute, but you might think, I hear this all the time, you might think your sexual relationship outside of marriage and that Maybe bearing children in that relationship are a good thing until you stand next to the radiant goodness of my 42 years with one woman. Been faithful only to her. And I won't have to say a thing. You won't get any condemnation from me. But holiness and light expose darkness and instability and they bring conviction and they bring change. when your children begin to act out the instability that you've lived while you thought it was okay and you stand next to the stability and the sweetness of my kids who are living godly lives and raising godly children, then sin is exposed for the destruction it brings to more than just you. Light exposes darkness. Light brings change. And I don't have to say a thing. All I need to do is love. All I need to do is be who Jesus made me to be. It's all you need to do. All I need to do is radiate his heart. All I need to do is be walking, talking mercy everywhere I go. That criminal next to Jesus felt it and it changed him. He says, we're getting what we deserve, but you've done nothing wrong. And that looks a lot to me like a form of confession and repentance, right? I'm wrong. I'm getting what I deserve. And Jesus' response isn't, yeah, you're getting what you deserve, you're going to have to suffer it for a while. His response is, today, you're going to be a companion of the garden. Today. 
See, it's, this guy's at the end of his life. He's about to die, but it's never too late to admit failure. It's never too late to confess it. It's never too late to receive him. I talked to somebody recently who genuinely said, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to come into church and think God's going to get me because I've done so many bad things. And I want to say, companion of the garden, come home. There's nothing but love here. Come home. All that criminal asked for was to be remembered in Jesus' kingdom. Jesus made him a companion, a, a companion of the garden. See, when darkness gets compared to light, light wins. When love confronts hatred, love wins. But it was more than just a revelation of his own sin this criminal got. That isn't where it stops. You know, there's, there's a piece of Christian history where everybody comes and repents every Sunday. They get saved like every Sunday, you know. I got saved last week. Okay, I'm back next week. I got to get saved again. And we thought the Catholics, you know, had a, had a monopoly on confessing to the priest every week. Well, Pentecostals did it too. <laughs> you get saved every week. So it was more than just a revelation of his sin that he got. It was a revelation of who Jesus really is. Can you imagine this? The man's hanging there. He's within an inch of his life. He's in more suffering than you and I can imagine, and he gets a picture of who Jesus really is. He gets it. See, a companion of the garden is going to be an intimate friend. Did you get that part? If you don't want to be an intimate friend of Jesus, why are you here? You know, I mean, I, I want to be an intimate friend of Jesus. But my friends, my friends are those who know me. Friends are people who understand you, right? They recognize who you are. They know your heart. Well, this criminal dying in agony on the cross said, you have done nothing wrong. That's the beginning of the revelation of knowing Jesus, that there's nothing wrong in him, nothing. And Jesus had been accused of a whole list of crimes. He says, you've done nothing wrong. The Romans posted a sign over his head said, King of the Jews. Well, to the Romans, that was treasonous. There's no king but Caesar. You claim yourself to be a king under the Romans, you're a dead man. No king but Caesar. Well, Jesus did claim to be Israel's king, but not of this earth. So this man on the cross recognizes that Jesus is and was our true, really, truly our king. He realized that there was nothing wrong in this claim. He is the king. Wow, what a revelation. Would you look at a guy cut, bleeding, condemned, hanging on a cross, an inch from death, and recognize him as a king. But this man next to Jesus did. So now just being exposed to Jesus, even as Jesus was dying, brings a revelation to this man that Jesus is eternal. Because, because, he said, when you come into your kingdom, now think about that a minute. Jesus is going to die. How is he going to come into a kingdom? So this man next to Jesus knows that Jesus will come again in an eternal kingdom. Did you get that? Just being exposed to who Jesus is gave him this revelation. Now he knows Jesus, and Jesus says, companion of the garden, today. You've done nothing wrong. And while he's realizing his own sin, that his own suffering was what he deserved, he recognized that Jesus was guiltless. That's huge. See, if, if Jesus hadn't been perfect, if there had been sin in his life, then he could only have died for his own sin. In order to die for us, he had to be sinless. And this guy on the cross, you have done nothing wrong, recognizes the sinlessness of Jesus and became a companion of the garden. He knew who Jesus was. Jesus was accused of blasphemy by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, claiming to be the Son of God, Messiah, God incarnate. Well, the Pharisees of the day and the Sadducees saw that as the most heinous of crimes, worthy of death. That's why they cried, crucify him. But the thief next to him says, you've done nothing wrong. So he recognized that Jesus was and is who he said he was. You see how loaded this is? 
that his claims were the truth, that what Jesus was saying wasn't blasphemous because it was the truth. Because he'd opened his heart to a revelation of who Jesus is, Jesus took him on as an intimate companion of the garden. He knew him, he understood. And you know what? Jesus didn't preach a sermon to that criminal next to him. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. I find myself thinking about the old Jesus movement days. We'd go running around the streets, you know, we'd get in people's face and we'd say, you know Jesus. <laughs> Do you know where you're going to go if you die tonight? You know, that kind of stuff. And we'd preach a little sermon to him on the street and people came to the Lord back then. I'll tell you what, that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work anymore. What works, what works is people finding out that they're loved in a way they were never loved before. What works is when the Father's heart comes through us with such power and such purity that it breaks people's hearts. So Jesus didn't preach a sermon. He didn't have to. He didn't hand him a theology. The raw presence of Jesus had already imparted a theology. He didn't impart some body of doctrine to this guy to confess and memorize. He didn't lead him in the sinner's prayer so he'd get his ticket to the heaven all cheap. He was just being Jesus, just being himself. And that was enough. That's what did it. His selflessness, his purity, and his holiness, when it was revealed in all of its goodness, was enough. And in response, the criminal broke and said, I've been wrong. And Jesus said, today I'm the king and you're a companion of the garden. We don't need to go around condemning sin, people. We've been real good at that. You know, I look out here and I see a lot of people with innocent looks on your faces and I keep reminding you, remember, I read your Facebook posts. <laughs> I know what you're really like. I do. We don't need to go around condemning sin. It's there. I'm not denying that. And it's wrong. I'm not denying that either. But when the unclean encounters the holy, the unclean is exposed for what it really is, and hearts get changed. I mean, do we really believe that? I do. We don't need to rail against homosexuality. We don't need to preach the evils of fornication to people who are living together without benefit of marriage. We don't need to condemn or speak bitterly of the welfare mom who has three kids by different fathers. We don't need to judge the crack addict. We don't need to judge the pothead. We don't need to judge the alcoholic. We don't need to condemn the stripper or the pornographer. We don't need to do any of that. What we need to be about is the business of revealing who Jesus is. Who is he really? We need to reveal the one who suffered death in love for our sake and rose from the grave in power to free us from that bondage and do it without condemnation. And the next thing is we need to get some real faith imparted into us. Faith enough to believe the promise that if we will do that, then Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and we don't have to. We just love so can we plumb the depths of the heart of Father God? Can we take that in and be changed by it? Can we get so desperately hungry that that's what we cry out for? That's the revival to come, people. The revival to come is a revelation of the Father's heart deeper than we ever imagined, thought, or believed. The goal of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is this. I'm going to read it in a minute, and it fits this whole story. Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells you. Now listen, when light comes, darkness is conquered. Did you get that? Death is beaten. Verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh 
to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Jesus died. He was raised. He ascended into heaven. He sent us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us every minute of every day, and we are changed. How complicated is that? (laughs) Verse 14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So, if we're led by the Spirit of God, then we love like God. See, to be a son of God or a daughter of God is to act, look, think, and be like God. So, if we're led by the Spirit of God, then we love like God. We live day to day like Jesus. We think like Him. We're immersed in Him. We radiate the Father's heart like Him. And if that's not your goal in life, you're headed in the wrong direction. Verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And you all know that means simply Daddy. That's another level of intimacy, isn't it? You get to be a companion of the garden with the king, but you get to look your God in the face and call him Daddy and know his warmth and his strength and his covering, and his protection, and his counsel. And then chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew. In other words, if you're here today, God determined from the foundation of the universe that you would be here today. You're here for a divine appointment today. I'm serious. He foreknew. He also predestined. Doesn't make any difference what you've done with yourself. God had your number before you were born. You thought you chose him. Silly you. <laughs> he chose you. You thought, I, you know, way back when they had that campaign, I found Jesus. No, I didn't find Jesus. I'm not that smart. Jesus found me because he predestined, because he foreknew, because he loved me that much and he loves you that much. If you're questioning whether you were chosen, you're sitting here today. And if you think you decided to come to church today, think again. You're not that smart. (laughs) I'm serious. This is the love of the Father. And he chose you. (laughs) <laughs> for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son it is your destiny to become like Jesus in every way that's why we became Christians I didn't become a Christian to be painless I didn't become a Christian so he would solve all my problems I didn't become a Christian so he'd heal my body I didn't become a Christian so he'd make me rich I became a Christian so that he would make me like him in everything that I am (laughs) so we're living in this world that's full of people who are just like the criminals hanging next to Jesus they don't need us to correct their wrong perceptions They don't need our condemnation. They don't need us to tell them they're wrong. What they need to they need to see and feel the spirit of Jesus flowing out of us. That's what they need. That we would be sons and daughters of God. The kind of thing flowing out of us that flowed out of Jesus on the cross and convicted that criminal. See, can we believe, I mean really believe, that the resurrection power of Jesus and the heart of the Father, the impact of the Holy Spirit in us, can and will reveal darkness, and that it'll reveal sin, it'll bring a world to repentance. And not one word of condemnation or judgment had to come from us. Can I be a living revelation of who Jesus really is? Can you? Would you? Would you want the fullness of the radiance of Jesus to so penetrate your flesh that nothing remains but who he is in and through you? I don't have time for anything else. And I can tell you it's so good. So good. 
You might, um, thinking of some things that have happened in my family recently, and you might think we were this wonderful, perfect family living on another plane. Ooh, yeah, I wish. <laughs> but we've had our problems. We have. Nathan and I alienated for years, working through stuff for years. But you know what? We share a desire that permeates my family that I want the Father's heart. I want it for mine. I want it to be me. I want it to be there in all my dealings, I want it there in all my relationships. And as a result, we keep growing together. Nathan and I had a breakthrough. He ought to take drugs more often, actually. He, <laughs> he came up out of the anesthetic having had a tremendous revelation from the Lord. He shared a little bit of that with you. But what he didn't share was some of what was between us got revealed by the Lord and he remembered a whole bunch of stuff and we, Nathan and I came together in a whole new way. And I know it's because, I know it's because I want to conform to the image of the Son and he wants to conform to the image of the Son and my daughters and my sons-in-law want to conform to the image of the Son. You get that in front of you, it'll change everything. Everything. Until nothing remains but he who is in and through you. I don't have time for anything else. So it begins with those two revelations. One, we are suffering justly. My sin's been exposed. I see it because I'm standing next to what's perfect. And two, looking at Jesus, you have done nothing wrong and you're a king. I'm a sinner. You're the holy one. And Jesus' response is, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today, you're a companion of the garden. Today, you're honored. Today, you have an access to me that no one who doesn't know me can possibly imagine. I can hear the sound of heaven in the voice.